the California Endowment. Increasing access to health care for all Californians. My interest in food did not begin with um, french fries and burgers. My interest in food in this country began by following the harvest in California and beginning to understand where our food comes from. And the fact of the matter is, if you want to eat a healthy diet, you are dependent on the millions of Americans who pick our fruits and vegetables by hand. Um, and so our good health is inextricably linked to their work. And farm workers have been the poorest, most exploited workers in the United States since America was founded. Uh, and again and again, you see ethnic minorities uh, being exploited and being used. You know, you can think, you can talk about the slavery of African Americans, uh, the enslavement of Native Americans in this state uh, before there were other ethnic groups brought in again and again. And a hundred years ago, President Teddy Roosevelt uh, had a commission to explore um, the exploitation of migrant workers in this state. So it's a problem that is perennial. And I find that there are a few steps forward, um, like the movement of uh, the United Farm Workers and Cesar Chavez, and then there's a reaction against it. And again and again, you see the people on the top who are profiting enormously from our food industry squeezing the people at the very bottom uh, and the people who can least afford these harms. And when the minimum wage laws were uh, written at the federal level, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which was passed uh, during the Great Depression, it specifically exempted farm workers from the minimum wage, from overtime, and from child labor laws. And that's very important to keep in mind in seeing this film. Now, there have been changes to the Fair, Staber, Fair, Fair Labor Standards Act since then, but still, in agriculture, you are able to work children uh, to an extent, and very young children, 12 years old, 14 years old, in a way that you never could uh, in a factory. Uh, I've had that relationship with food for a very long time, where it came, I knew exactly where it came from. Mm -hmm. But we, I mean, we picked it ourselves. Um, I didn't know until coming to Los Angeles, meeting David Damien Figueroa and Dolores Huerta and Arturo Rodriguez and the UFW, uh, that I go, oh, there's a big machine behind this. And it wasn't until I read your book. Uh, reading Eric's book made me stop drinking coffee at McDonald's. <laughs> like, I refused to give him 50 cents. <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't even eat McDonald's a lot, but I said, I cannot support this, this you know, institution. Um, and so when uh, I was approached, uh, I d I've done a lot of activism for UFW and farm workers. And I always stood up on a podium, and they gave me a speech, and they let me say talking points, and I would raise money for them. But I started asking questions of, but what, well, why is why is this, why, what are we raising funds for? What is this, why hasn't this been fixed? And uh, that was the reason why I went back to get my master's in Chicano studies, because I didn't understand why there was still so much oppression within our community um, in 2011. And that's when I learned more mm -hmm. about the agricultural system and about the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938 that has never been amended for agriculture, but has been amended for everything else. Um, and they said they were just astonished at how many children were still in the fields and that it was happening in the United States. And we've screened this documentary all over the world already. We, we started in Guadalajara, and we, we've been all over the country screening it. And people go, oh, yeah, is that Mexico? Is that China? Is that, like, where is that? And you go, it's in the United States. Mm -hmm. We wanted to humanize the issue because people don't really know about it. Um, and they think that um, they're illegals. And this is not a labor issue. This, this documentary is not about lab, uh, um, immigration issues. It is about labor issues, but it's a human issue. So if you're a human being, you would relate to this film. You would understand this film. If you have children, you would understand it. So people tried to make this film about immigration reform, and it really isn't about that. 80% of the kids in the fields in the United States were born in the United States. So these kids are American children, and this is, um, you know, they're stuck in the cycle of poverty because they can't, uh, get out of, of working to support their families. So hmm. I just felt it was, you know, it needed, uh, it needed the, the championing, and, and I was happy to step up. So I'm, growing up in rural California, we grew up with those stories, and we grew up in those communities uh, of farm workers. 
uh, we were raised by farm workers. And so for, for, for us, uh, the, the idea was uh, those families, uh, my extended family, my aunts, my uncles, they were all migrant farm workers. The difference became when my father decided after World War II that he was no longer going to follow the crops. And so he settled us out. And by settling us out, we were able then to go to school. There was no break in our education. Uh, and and uh, my, my, my siblings were able to, to then go to school. But we grew up in communities where, where a lot of our relatives had a broken education. They would, uh, a month or so before school ended, they were following the crop. They'd just leave Imperial County and they'd go up, central, up to Central Valley. They would come back late. Uh, and so we grew up around, uh, around, uh, around that, knowing that, that even though our parents, just like the parents in, in the film, how all parents think that education will break the cycle of poverty, we saw that that was not going to be the, the experience of those kids and those relatives around us. But yet it made, made a difference with us because of the fact that we settled down. And so it was that experience in, in growing up in that rural place uh, with migrancy around you that led me to think that I wanted to get involved with, with, uh, with labor law, with civil rights laws that affect farm workers. And that's what I decided to do. The Farm Labor Standards Act, I mean, the reality of it is in this country is that there's, there, there's two sets of laws. There's those that apply to labor, and those laws do not apply to farm labor. You mentioned the Farm Labor St Standards Act. Why don't children why aren't children valued the same way by those federal laws? Why aren't those laws applicable equally to all children? Um, children are not supposed to uh, go to go to work and be employed in, in labor in, in labor 12 years of age. In agriculture, they can be. In other industries, 14 years of age. Children are not supposed to be involved, or youth are not supposed to be involved in dangerous occupations until they're 18 years of age. Why do they get exposed to those hazardous occupations when they're 16 years of age just because they're in agriculture, just because they're children of farm workers or because they are farm worker children? That dual system of law is wrong. It, it, the law doesn't recognize them, but consumers don't either. Mm -hmm. And that's the important thing about, I think, uh, uh, when people do watch this. If you're a consumer, if you buy a tomato, if you buy an avocado, if you eat a salad at a restaurant, it is 20% likely that it was touched by a child somewhere in that process. Mm -hmm. You eat a salad and it has five different condiments on it, it one of those was touched by a child. Um, and um, I think we talked about this backstage, but I was reading a Time Magazine news article and they were comparing organic to non-organic, milk, eggs, meat, mm -hmm. and, uh, and vegetables, produce. And so they did price comparison. So the Time Magazine was saying, should you buy free range beef? Is it better? Is it worth the, the mm. 30 cents more? And they said, absolutely, because the, the, what they do to the cows and how they do that, you should absolutely buy free-range beef. Should you buy free-range chicken? Absolutely, because what it can do to your health of the chickens and those coops and blah, blah, blah. Uh, milk, absolutely, you should absolutely pay the 35 cents more for this. When it came to produce, Time Magazine said, no, you should not, because the amount of pesticides isn't really going to affect uh, you as much as the other things. And I said, nobody put a price on human suffering. Nobody said, you should not, you should absolutely buy organic, because that means these kids and these farm workers were not sprayed by pesticides. They said, you're not going to ingest as much, so you should not pay that yeah. much more for organic food. And it, no, they didn't factor in farm workers. Yeah, and I think that's one of the strongest arguments for right. organic food. I think you know, officially it's something like 20 to 30,000 farm workers suffer acute pesticide poisoning, meaning they had to go to a doctor. But the numbers, the real numbers are much, much larger. And in these um, communities where the pesticides drift into the houses, I mean, the rates of cancer, the rates of poor health are really, really terrible. And, and there's so a direct correlation. I mean, there is. Direct. I mean, these are, these are poisons that are designed to kill things and they harm people as well. And, and as, the, uh, as the token Anglo on stage, I'm going <laughs> to say the word that often isn't said enough in this subject, which is racism. Mm. And I really believe that if these were you know, white uh, 
blonde-haired children, we might not tolerate the abuse the same way. And that's not just a theory, but one of the great, great works written about farm workers was The Grapes of Wrath. And it created enormous sympathy for the plight of farm workers. But really, if you look at California history for the last 150 years, there's only about eight years in which white people work the fields in California. It was during the Great Depression in which about half a million Mexicans and Mexican-Americans were driven out of this state so that white people could take their jobs and work the fields. And then as soon as World War II started um, and uh, there were jobs in factories, the white people went to work in the factories and uh, Mexicans and um, Mexican-Americans were brought back to the field. So we have to address the race issue in talking about the exploitation of farm workers. And Ava, I mean, I'm curious about how do we make this so it's not just a Latino issue, so that it's a human rights issue, and how do we get people, particularly in the Hollywood community, who aren't Latino, but just, mm -hmm. you know, are to be angry about what's happening in America? I know, I ask that all the time because um, uh, people's focus, especially Hollywood, focuses a lot on international causes. AIDS in Africa, very important. Um, what is it, the dolphins in Japan, oh. very important. Very uh, important, the dolphins. Very important. Uh, but <laughs> but I'm, nobody focuses a lot on domestic issues, American issues. And that's why I chose this one, uh, this particular cause. But also, um, I find food is, is a way in. Yeah. I find food is a very valuable way in. Um, I think uh, media is a great tool to humanize issues, but also uh, to, to get awareness. And so we did the film always as a political tool, always as we need to change policy. Um, and, and we do that through festivals and screenings like this so that you would tell people and they would tell people and hope that it would get a momentum, just like my big fat Greek wedding would, yeah. you know, where people go, that was a great movie. Um, so. It's, I, I don't know the answer to how do you get more non-Latinos involved. Mm -hmm. um, because anytime you say the racism thing, uh, you bring that up, it, be, it immediately becomes the immigration issue. And you're right, there has been this huge push and pull over centuries with workers, and particularly Mexican workers and Mexican-American workers. And so, um, you know, there's a, a, a great book called They Take Our Jobs by Aviva Chomsky, and she kind of debunks every myth. They don't pay taxes. They're taking our jobs. Uh, you know, they take social services. They, and it is an amazing book because it really tells you the history of immigration. And if you understand how you're welcomed as workers but denied as citizens, and not even citizens, voting citizens, but just denied as community members, um, it's not fair, and, and it's been historic. And all the, the, the um, advances that Caesar made 30, 40 years ago have unfortunately been dismantled and continue to be. Yeah, well, I, um, I, I always have hope that, um, that in this country, images of children can make a difference to people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the children in, this, in, in the film uh, have those stories uh, to tell of how you're 12 years of age and yet you lose hope and nobody cares. Uh, the idea that a child at 14 says, um, they ask him about their, her dreams and she says, well, my dreams are on hold. I don't it's, have any. I don't have, I, yeah. The idea that we don't care that children at those ages are losing their, they have no childhood. Uh, at some point, to me, it seems that the public can't care. Mm -hmm. The public will care. These, I, I, I wouldn't have invested that time in, in the work that I've done not believing that, that, we, that the public can make a difference. How they get involved, uh, how you work through your politicians is, an, is, is another thing. But it seems to me that when you have a message out there of, of how we mistreat children and, and what it says about our society, I do believe that good people can stand up and at some point make that their cause. Here, there, there's data about 400,000 children. Some people say that there are 1.2 million of those children out there migrating that way. California has 230,000 children that migrate just like that mm -hmm. today. Um, 
They have a different migration pattern. They're, they're children who come up from, half of them come up from Mexico into California and back. They, 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 40 percent of them migrate up and down the state. And about 10 percent are the migrant that go from state to state. Somebody has to care for those quarter of a million children. And, and I think that that's where your story starts. It starts with a message. And that the question is, what are we going to do about it? Uh, I saw Eric on, uh, on a program, uh, what do you call it, TEDx? What, what is that thing? TED. Te it's TED, uh, where you made a statement, Eric, that if you eat, that if you eat, you should care about those workers who are, who are paid slave wages. Mm -hmm. If you eat, you have to care about those children who don't have any schooling. Mm -hmm. If you eat, somebody's got to care about those women who are victims of sexual harassment, if you eat. And it seems to me that I, that is the message that needs, that I think you connect yeah. when, when we see children working out there, being poisoned, uh, knowing that they have no sense of future, and yet it's their hands that are feeding us daily. And, and that's got, the public has got, the message is there. We have to keep on asking ourselves, what am I going to do? What are we going to do for those children? Because they do feed us. But, but Jose, what about the argument that if we, if we increase the wages of these workers, we won't be able to afford our food? Hmm. That, that was the argument, too, with the chicken, uh, the proposition with the chicken cages, that hmm. the chicken farmers were saying, you, we cannot provide bigger cages because then we'll go under. Yeah, right? and that law was passed. And, and it was. And there is no more chicken in California, right? I mean, I, feel like <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think we were talking about it. When you buy a, a bottle of wine from Napa, and Napa has you know, enormous homelessness among migrants because the wages are relatively high in this state, but the housing is so expensive that it, at, in the grape harvest, you have thousands of people sleeping in cars, sleeping in garages, and sleeping outdoors. When there's a bottle of wine from Napa that costs 50 or $60, I think it's 20, 25 cents goes to the workers. So, you know, maybe if you paid $50 and 25 cents, you know, you could double the wages of these workers. And, 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 and I'm curious about your thoughts about how does it work that the people who can afford at least are the ones who are squeezed out of that quarter? Well, that's one of the stories that, that's one of the, the stories told the, the woman who goes into the grocery store and looks at the tomatoes that I think the family has picked and she cannot afford the tomato. She can't afford, she doesn't understand that they're three dollars mm. for mm. one when she said I, I had to pick four buckets for three dollars, you know, of tomato. I mean, it, it, it's really, that's one of the most poignant parts of the film. Yeah, I, it, I was, I had, I, I read uh, some time ago uh, a similar comparison uh, you talked about wine, uh, about lettuce. Um, a head of lettuce for one dollar, how, how much of that one dollar goes to the worker? Eight cents to the dollar. So people would think if you paid eight more cents for that lettuce and it went to the worker, that would double that worker's salary and that worker would not be in poverty. The, it doesn't work that way. Uh, be, that's just not the way you as a consumer cannot say my extra eight cents for my head of lettuce, I want it to go to the farm worker. Mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, it is about laws. It is about people saying that when, when we have minimum wage, they need to apply to all of these workers. Minimum wage does not apply to those young kids. There's no law that gives them minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And those kids working at peace rate, minimum wage may be $7. Those kids are picking $2 an hour and nobody cares. At some point, it is about the wages that allow families like that to live decently. Mm -hmm. And so to that extent, even though we're not supposed to be pontificating about legislation and things of that type, the idea of having decent wage for workers and their families is part of what this is about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we all need to, to be unafraid of, of saying that in this country, workers that feed us need to have a human wage that allows them to raise families in a decent way. Yeah. so that they can have decent housing, so that their children have a chance to go to school, and, and the rest. Just what we would want for our families. And I think that, that those kinds of questions, uh, we all need to, 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 um, to ask ourselves, what are we doing about that? You know? You know, and along those lines, anytime a vote is put to the public, 
or the consumer, which, which is what we are, uh, a, a penny more a pound for produce would, would do a lot. A yeah. penny more a pound. And any time that uh, it's put to the, the, the public for a vote or, or legislation trying to get passed, the wording of these laws, which you guys know is very interesting. You know, when they dismantled bilingual education, they said English for the children. And they go, oh, I want English for the children. Yeah. It's not that, you know, uh, uh, for, the, for the gay marriage, it said uh, uh, protect marriage act. I want to protect marriage. And you don't know what you're voting yeah. for. So whenever they word these laws, they'll say uh, they want to charge you to fix that. And you go, oh, no, 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 no. Without knowing it's one cent, it's eight cents. Yeah. I, I, I think that's worth it. You know? And there is a great organization um, in Florida, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, that has been campaigning for an extra penny per pound for tomatoes. And uh, you know they've doubled the wages of the workers, and a penny a pound, you know, is in the supermarket price is almost nothing. 